ISPEX 2024. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and also some new ones in the room. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and join us today. Uh, the challenge for all of us when we're putting together the seminar programme is to try and ensure that we have something for everybody. And our membership is such a diverse cohort now, which is a wonderful thing. But it does mean that we have to think quite carefully about our seminar content. And today, we are going to be presenting three diverse seminars that we hope there is something for everyone truly. Shortly, we will be having the Hopkins Baldwin Lecture, named for two inspirational leaders who are sitting in front of me here, who were manufacturers of public address systems and also past presidents of this institute. Um, the second seminar today is uh, named for two practitioners within the field, one in amplification and the other in electroacoustics, and that will be a technical paper. And then in the afternoon, we will have the Walker Lecture, named after a founding father of the Institute, where we will all be challenged to consider cybersecurity risks that should affect us both professionally and personally. And so there shouldn't be any barrier to anybody attending that lecture. Welcome also to those of you who are watching our live feed. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We will be trying to run to fairly strict time so that you can duck in and out as necessary. And perhaps next year you'll be tempted to come and join us in person. As chair, my job is to be quite strict with the timekeeping um, and also to encourage you to go and visit our fantastic exhibitors that are over in the marquee tent. So it'd be ideal if during every break session, you'll note during the seminar day, there's plenty of white space for you to go and meet with our exhibitors who are here supporting us again this year. So without further ado, we need to start our 10 o'clock seminar. And this is entitled Quiet, Please. We have Brew who will be telling us about the Lawn Tennis Association and how PA is used to make Win Wimbledon louder. And I wonder if he's going to tell us about the thing that always makes my inner child snicker when it comes loud and clear across any broadcast. New balls, please. So over to Brew. Welcome. Morning, all. Um, hey, thanks for having me. Um, always kind of a bit nerve wracking. I mean, I, I'll talk nonsense about all this kind of stuff all day long, but actually to stand in front of a room full of people who know an awful lot more about a lot of this stuff than I do, but also have been doing it, you know, much longer than I have. Is, you know, so bear with if I fluff any of this up. So, um, yes, Wimbledon. The, what is it? You might be aware that we are a, um, uh, you might have heard of the championships and what we do, but by the inspiration for kind of this talk today was a, a sign that we've got um, on our stairwell. It's like, where else? can you silence the crowd of, it's not actually 15,000, it's just shy of 15,000 in centre court, but the umpire can stand there or sit there and just go, quiet please, and they will all go quiet. That kind of atmosphere in centre court is something that I've never experienced in any other stadium or any other event anywhere in the world. You can have, I must say, just shy of 15,000 people absolutely silent as they're serving for championship point. And then you have utter uproar. And actually, you can hear that also around the ground as that moment happens. So how did this all start? So way back in 1877, over only 11 days, um, the then All England Croquet and Lawn Tennis Club um, held a competition of 22 men that at the final, only 200 people attended. 30 of those were sat on a temporary wooden stand, I've read. Um, so fast forward that now to 2023, and um, it's a little bit different. We've moved from our, our location in uh, Walpole Road. We're now at Church Road, and um, the grounds look something a bit like that. And we have, for the 136 championships last year, we had a record of attendance of over half a million guests through our gates during the championship fortnight, not to mention the 10,000 that we had at qualifying, and then 
the 370 million that also watched it on the telly. So um, those are the events or the competitions that go together to make up the championships. It's not just a men's and women's um, race, as it were. So that equates to something like 740 tennis matches, um, and it comes out at something like 1,300 hours of tennis across the fortnight in um, 2013. It's very different to a 90 or 80 minute match in one stadium on a Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, the, the pace is somewhat different. Um, so how do we actually make that all, all work? Um, well, we've got our, our two stadiums with retractable roofs, um, centre and number one court. And we've got our two open air stadiums, uh, number two court, number three court. And then we've got our open championships courts, not to mention our indoor practice courts, our practice courts up at Orangia Pavilion at the north end of the grounds. We've got um, clay courts, indoor acrylic courts, um, and our other venues, Roehampton and Range Park, which are off-site um, practice venues. So we are a busy, multifaceted, um, very busy site. Um, as I say, it's the closest kind of event that I've been involved in that is akin to the championships is something like the Olympics. If you were doing the track and field or something in the um, aquatic centre or something like that, where actually you have all the velodrome, where you've got daily competition, but even those are generally broken down into blocks, whereas we have something like 18 matches happening concurrently and obviously they end and finish and roll over and stuff like that. So we're all interested in actually how we make the audio bit work. Um, so that's where we are, um, the actual um, how we make the tennis louder. So if we just focus here on um, court 14, um, to reinforce the umpire, so we have a microphone on the umpire's um, chair, that is to reinforce um, what that is, that is being said during the match. Also a bunch of other stuff, we'll come to that in a little while. So here on court 14, um, we've got our A circuit, which is um, a pair of uh, Tannoy VLS uh, 30s, I think they are. Um, and then on the opposite corner, just kind of off the bottom of the picture there, is the, um, is the B circuit. And this kind of A, B topology is basically what we try and copy across all of the courts. Um, some courts have slightly more loudspeakers. Um, if we look at, um, oh sorry, let me step back one, I've missed, I missed an important speaker. We also have a third loudspeaker um, on the umpire's chair, a little KRA um, KZ14. Um, I'll come back to that um, later. But, so we have across that particular court, there is just three amplifier circuits driving those five loudspeakers. And that is a kind of model that's kind of rippled, certainly across all the open courts. Um, if we look at centre court, um, we've actually got 74 loudspeakers um, in the roof of that stadium um, across um, you know, eight different loudspeakers, sorry, 12 different loudspeaker circuits, I'm jumbling my numbers up. So the model is repeated, they're notionally A and B to give us kind of interleaved coverage, um, but that's kind of the model that we ripple across um, all of it. Um, last time I checked, we had something like 900 individual amplifier circuits on our rounds. Um, so that includes all of the tennis courts that I've just talked about, and then also through our inhabited spaces, the buildings, um, the circulation areas, the, the open areas and all that kind of stuff. Um, not to mention there's a bit of extra kit that comes in for the championships as overlay, supported by um, our kind of partner, RG Jones. So, and that, some of that overlay stuff would be um, what we would have um, like here on the hill. So we have regular kind of line array loudspeakers that come in here to reinforce this. So this is kind of over and above what we would have as our installed system. Um, but just jumping back one there, that's kind of the extent of what we're trying to cover. So those are where the actual tennis is happening. Um, on top of that, we've got um, our golf course, which is just off the picture to the right here. We've got our media center, kind of between court 14 and 18. Um, and then we've got lots of other temporary structures, housing, hospitality. We've got internal suites uh, where we've got um, our official partners or, or other people using um, function areas and stuff like that. Not to mention just playing a bit of background music in the, uh, in the shop or the restaurant. Okay. So that's kind of, we'll go about this in kind of reverse order. So that's our kind of output, if you like, the very end of it. So how do we actually drive that? Um, we have... Um, as of today, we have um, a total of 10 PA rack spaces um, on the ground. Um, 
they are either our own dedicated PA spaces or they're kind of um, shared other technology spaces where we might be cohabiting with um, the kind of corporate network team, so the kind of regular kind of network IT kit that you might come across, um, or IPTV land or something like that. I say we, we, we kind of cohabit quite, quite well. Um, so this was our, it, our, this is our picture of our, our rack room in Centre Court. We've generally converged on the Crown DCI series of amplifiers, um, predominantly using the, the N Blue Link versions. Um, and that's um, come about because, A, we've been using them for so, for so long, but also it kind of works um, with our kind of ecosystem. Um, now, Justin from BSS is, is here with us in the back, and there's a, I'm sure there's a few other Harman team here. So, um, but the, we've worked really closely with them, and we encountered a bit of a, a kind of anomaly, a bit of an issue with how we'd got our standard model set up. So, I was actually thinking about this on the drive up, and it was kind of akin to if you have a big LED wall, if you go and do a load of tests on it off the RF that's coming off that that single panel it's fine, isn't it? It behaves, it's compliant, it ticks all the boxes, happy days. However, when you stack a couple of hundred of those tiles up together and make them into a big video wall like you would have at the Brits or at Glastonbury or something like that, all of a sudden that, that compliant bit of, of, of tolerance is just amplified and magnified and actually it becomes a bit of a problem. So our standard model um, was that we would have our processing done in BSS Soundwebs, um, we would have um, a Dante version, and then we would have um, so the 806, and then we'd have 160s underneath that if we needed a bit more horsepower. Then we'd go through our A series of amplifiers, then we'd go into our B processor, and down through our B stack of amplifiers. So creating a nice redundant ring, it was self-healing, it was great, everything worked. However, what we'd actually, we were experiencing was um, every now and again, we'd get a little drop in audio. Now, Yes, we're running program material into our hospitality suites and the like, um, but actually we, a lot of what we're, our content is, is paging, is announcements, or, or is, our, is our umpire. So if they were to perhaps drop half a syllable, not everybody would notice. So obviously I and my team noticed, because we're like, hang on a minute, we're dropping audio here. But there was a bit of a sense that is this just the golden ears of the sound department that are complaining about this? Is there a real issue here? Is it really the network? Um, so we spent, um, it kind of rumbled on in the background, but um, one of the uh, positives um, to come out of the, the pandemic was that the grounds went silent at Wimbledon. Championships was cancelled. All of the other events, so alongside the championships, there's countless other open and indoor events. There's a load of... Um, um, kind of corporate functions for, for, for want of a better kind of acronym um, that happen throughout um, the site and the day and all of that stopped so it gave us an opportunity where we could actually properly focus on this issue we could look at what was going on try some different things and then leave it as a soak test without there being other changes that came in so as I say this was our, our typical ring and we were getting this kind of drop in audio and we we're like how do we actually work out what's what's going on here? What's the what's causing this? Where are we hearing it? So um, we kind of literally sat around the table and we going right. How do we work out when our DSPs stop passing audio? You know, I don't want to sit there and listen to tone all day long. You know, that's that's I've got much better things to do in my life. Um, so what we did was um, uh, build um, a bit of a logic function within. Um, Audio Architect um, and London Architect. Um, London Architect is where a lot of our processing still resides. I appreciate some of you might think that's a little bit old in the tooth now. Um, but over the years, we've built some quite comprehensive and extensive um, uh, workflows within that that we kind of wanted to retain. And, and really, I'm a comms guy at heart. So, you know, stick me in front of a, a, a real artist frame that looks a little bit like Windows, you know, 11, and I'm, I'm well happy. So, so the, the, the roundness and the, the shininess that you get with some of the kind of later, uh, more recent applications that a lot of manufacturers do, just give me the functions. I'm more than happy with the functions. So, I just say, we built this kind of little logic trigger. So, and then we were able to fire that into um, uh, a thing called Node Red. I don't know whether anybody's kind of come across and used that. And then we went, they were into dis sorry, put my teeth back in. Then able to display that within uh, a thing called Grafana, which gives us a kind of real time graph, a really nice graph UI where I can go and show 
the network team, you know, we sat on calls with, with people that um, are less interested in the mechanics of how the audio is all working and just trying to work out what the actual problem is. Um, and we were clearly able to display whether actually this drop in audio, was it every device in that rack room, within that ring? Um, when that happened, was it all of the rack rooms on site that hiccuped or, or what? So we were able, instead of just like, oh, did you hear, did, did I just drop out then? we actually had some proper detail of what was actually going on. Um, so having analysed this and, and then, as I say, using this quiet time to kind of basically go and, along with um, in conversation with the guys from Harman and the team from RG Jones, we we're like, actually, right, what can we try? You know, we've got the space, we've got the time, let's just replug this all up, see what actually d happens. And what we'd, in, in hindsight, what we'd done is we'd created our, our beautiful blue link ring but on opposing sides of that circle, we'd created touch points to a different clock domain, our Dante environment. So as tight and as succinct as all this is, every now and again, it would just get far enough out that it got upset about things and would then re-clock as it would do because it thinks it's upset. So I kind of spend quite a bit of time talking about this here to show while we are a big site with a lot of stuff, that kind of, is, is hinged on being able to constantly evolve and adapt to what we've got. It's not an installed, lock it off, walk away. And it's not just a, you've bought the boxes, see you later experience that we have with the manufacturers. It's, a, it's definitely a two way street and it's a, it's a joined up um, experience. So um, what we've done now is we've slightly adapted that, that model um, and we have now basically moved to using the sound webs as our, our, our processing, as, as we would do, but we would come out of that um, as Dante and then we would go into our amplifier stacks. We've now added um, the blue DAs to our blue link stacks. So we've kind of got a bit more of a kind of rock and roll traditional racks of amplifiers where we would go Dante in at the top and then a, a smaller blue link ring through a lump of amplifiers and onwards. And actually that's now made it a much more scalable and repeatable thing, which has aided us with the bringing on board of Roehampton and Rains Park, our two remote sites and how we manage that and how we manage that, that kind of processing. So we've done the loudspeakers, we've done the, the, the amplifiers, then let's start to look at our, our inputs. So kind of first and foremost, the purpose of the PA system at Wimbledon is public safety. We're not EN54, um, so it is just there as a um, kind of support mechanism to our safety teams. Um, yes, we need to have it uh, as part of the Green Guide guidance, but I say it, it's not a PAV system, PAVA system, it is just a PA system. Um, so even that all said, the very front end, um, at the moment we've got a TOA SX2000 system, and that's primarily used for our safety messaging system. That um, user station sits in our operation center in front of our uh, safety team, and during the championships, that's how they would invoke any kind of site-wide or, or um, emergency messaging, but equally the, can you please remove your buggies in the morning, the fire alarm's about to be tested, that concludes the test of the fire alarm, the gates are now closed. All of those things are initiated from that team using that system. Um, back in, you know, a good couple of years ago, our grounds announcer um, would also use a, a, a second paging station. Um, however, we found that we, people don't perhaps want all of that, you know, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry, but the uh, you know, rain has stopped play. The covers are now on. You can see all of that. Um, not everybody wants that message throughout the day. They might be busy doing other things. Or perhaps we want more granular control of, A, the tonality of that. We perhaps want our safety messaging to be like head split in front and centre. You can't dodge this. However, our grounds announcer, we want that to be a bit more warm and fluffy, like welcoming and comforting. Um, so um, we split that out and we now use a Glen Sound um, Inferno unit um, as, our, as what our ground announcer uses, much more akin to kind of a, a kind of commentary type idea. Um, it, that, that works really well because they, um, we can talk back into the grounds announcer's ears, cue them in, that kind of stuff. Um, we also then round um, a lot of our kind of hospitality suites and spaces. Uh, we use an awful lot of the Share Sure um, MX Wireless stuff, which is great because you can configure it with the users can on and off themselves or 
if they're not to be trusted, you can remove that privilege and you can just have a sound engineer at the back of the room who can push the fader up and down rather than me be pressing the button when I'm talking or not. Um, we also have a, a QLab system which serves up an absolute boatload of um, different genres of music and uh, something very dear to my heart, a, a large array of Christmas songs um, which I enjoy playing everywhere around the grounds for as long as I possibly can. <laughs> Um, so um, we've got those um, and then there's a couple of places where some of the suite holders might want to have their own content, their own music, something like that. So we would do that either with something like a, an Avio unit or some of the suites have got analog tie lines in so we'll take them in that way. So, um, and that's also true for a lot of those kind of overlay hospitality spaces where um, you know a suite holder might want their own content or they might devise their own kind of little experience show. So the guys from uh, White Light do a lot of stuff with Amex in one of the spaces um, and create quite a, quite an having created quite an involved um, experience in those spaces. Um, we take that content from them put an e-stop mute over the top of it and return it back into the space. So uh, we can either mute any loudspeakers that, that a third party is installed, or we can put safety messages, you know, duck the, con the program and put safety messaging through if that's what we decide we want to do. So, and we also, you might have seen those bits, we do the flash interviews um, on court. So those, uh, uh, radio mics, um, Sure Axiom Digital, um, we dual path these. So we put the receivers on the side of court. So on center court, they sit in our, our radio rack position. Um, we then take the, the Dante off the back of those um, via our, our kind of corporate network um, back to our world. Um, but we also take the analog straight off the back of that because I do not want to get a call from my boss and have to explain why the interview after the men's final did not work. Yeah, that's a very career limiting move and I do not want to be in that conversation. Okay, so, um, and uh, we repeat that again for um, number one, um, number two and number three court. Um, so we kind of, while centre court is the centre of our world and t does take a great deal of focus, we, we kind of ripple and, and um, kind of copy that um, workflow out to the other. So we kind of try and treat all of the courts the same, you know, whether you're playing on court seven or you're on centre court, we try and treat you the same, okay? So um, now we get onto our umpire microphones. So I'm quite proud of this because um, our umpire chairs only have a single microphone on it. Um, the other tennis tournaments and the other slams are getting, you know, kind of getting towards this way now, but a lot of them would have two microphones, one for broadcast and one for the bowl, um, whereas actually we use a single microphone. Um, and that actually goes um, to, to quite a lot of places um, uh, because of that. And we use the Biodynamic um, M201s, um, they're pretty rugged. Um, yes, we could put slightly better sounding microphones over there if we wanna get involved in improving that signal chain. However, when we've trialed any of those um, potentially you know, higher fidelity microphones, uh, we found that they don't stand up so well to being whacked with a tennis ball or left out in the rain. Um, so um, while we try and look after all our kit, you know, when the rain comes, a team of you know, five or six can only move so fast around 18 courts. So um, obviously the umpire needs to be able to turn themselves on or off to the bowl. They might wanna have a conversation with the player or actually they might be super diligent and just actually turn all the wind noise off for us as a human gate, um, which um, is absolutely brilliant. But that switch, um, so, I'm going to, we're kind of tight for time, so I'm going to try and resist the, the urge to deep dive down a lot of the rabbit holes that, that we've got here. I'm around all day, so if you want to talk more about any of it, do shout. Um, so that switch, that, as far as the umpire is concerned, is turning them on and off to their court, their stadium bowl, okay? Um, that switch is actually a GPI into the sound web in the bottom of the chair. That is then sent as an Ethernet trigger to our mic um, court control QLab system. That's then sending that as an OSC command to our championships mixing desk. So why all of that longness? You just put an inline mute, call it a day, surely. Um, but by doing it this way, it means that we can have the umpire open always, so we can always piffle it. Um, we can also send that into the intercom system. We can hand that off to broadcast. We can do whatever we need to do with it. And that 
mute then is a physical, is, it's the mute button on the desk. So actually it's a team of, um, that's predominantly made up of freelance sound engineers for them to walk into the room and see a regular sound desk and actually see the channel, you know, the umpire on court four is muted and the issue is the umpire on court four is not being heard. Um, it's a very obvious thing to, to, to enable. Um, it doesn't require anybody having to remember where in the, the, the extensive program that control is hidden or, or spend hours trying to build custom UIs to display all that information and then realize that you physically don't have enough screen estate to, to display all of that information. So as I say, that's how that switch works and the reason for that um, is because is it goes off to multiple places. Um, as well as feeding um, the, the, the bowl stadium, it also feeds our intercom system because that's how um, electronic line calling all works. In the, rev the review officials booth, um, we've got the, t the Hawkeye operators and we've got the kind of, I guess the equivalent of what, what VAR would be in kind of football and rugby, but you've got the kind of review official in the booth, they're ensuring that the systems are all working. That review official needs to be able to talk to the chair umpire. And that's what we use this little loudspeaker on the front of their tray for. So from their intercom panel, they are hearing the umpire mic permanently open and they can press the button on their intercom panel and talk to the umpire. Full duplex, glorious chocolatey sound, um, you know, unhindered by having to answer a phone or you know, read a message or, or answer a, a radio or something like that. Um, those, we also feed um, our commentary boxes. So um, we have a load of, uh, basically they're Nixa PD Dante units um, in our 120, I think it is, commentary positions um, around um, centre court number one, uh, two and three, where depending on what kind of broadcaster you've come from, you might have, a, if you're a radio journalist or something like that, you might have a chair in one of those booths. So from here, you can pick any one of, I think we're up to 48 audio sources on here. Obviously it will do 64 because it's Dante, but we kind of publish um, you know, 48 different audio sources on there, which means that from the booth, you can generate your, your package. Um, the other place that we kind of feed audio in and out of um, is our main interview room. And this was a new space um, built um, and commissioned for, for last year's championships um, and has just kind of just taken the mothballs out of it um, for our uh, official partner day launch, which happened last week as well. So it's a space that I'm really proud of because I was very heavily involved with the design and build of that, having started my career back in, in theatre land back in the day. Um, we've got a DMB um, PA system in there where we can obviously present um, content like this here, you know, regular stuff on stage. We've got a load of um, short microphones in there, a big LED wall so we can uh, present and talk and, and do all that kind of stuff. We've got nine, 10 microphones in the ceiling so we can pick up the questions um, in a conference like this, but also in those player interviews um, post-match when you might see them. I mean, you only ever see that bit of the interview room, sadly, um, during that moment, but that, that's what's going on in there. Um, and at least this will kind of feed together. Now, what you might find, you know, as a, in a regular stadium is you'd have a kind of like a production team, a sound team, you know, in, a, in one of the uh, suites or something like that over, overlooking the kind of field of play or the stadium space. We don't do that. We don't have an engineer on all 18 courts. Um, we have a, a central kind of control space, um, kind of our, our, our audio control room, um, which, it's got this name of 305 because probably about 25 years ago, the number on the door was 305. The rooms have all since long been renumbered and, and I don't think any of the team were there, who are there now, were there back in that day, but the kind of like beautiful bit of legacy, it's retained this number of 305. Um, the official name is the primary audio control room. Um, but we operate from in here. Um, we have um, a, a single space where we can control all 18 of those, those court mixes, as well as all of those hospitality suites, the stuff on the golf course, the stuff that's going out on the hill, that's going out on the southern village screen. Any audio that you hear on the grounds of SW19 has passed through this room, okay, or under the control of this room. Um, and we try and do that because it means towards the latter part of the day when you know, we've, we've, we've got tennis matches going on and everything's kind of settled down, you can run the site with a, a, quite a small number of people. Um, if you were to put people on every court, well, that's 18 people to start with. The days are long. You need 
a double shift and then what are we going to do about the music that's playing on the members' lawn and the hospitality suite? It all gets very complicated very quickly. So, um, I say, our audio control room. The, um, and we drive all of that through um, a Yamaha Revage, which is what we've been using in recent years. That's where we would have seen that mute um, uh, signal happen from. Um, the, we have a, an audio operator that sits in there and drives um, what you hear across all of the courts. Um, they can piffle on those, those Genelecs that are kind of pointing down at them, um, anything they like, but also, just stepping back there, there's, there's four Genelecs underneath that, that big wall of tellies. Um, we kind of have quite a, a big kind of room mix, if you like, that goes on in there. It's not a kind of fill spec to wall of sound. It is, um, to the uninitiated, it is a bit overwhelming to start with, but actually when you kind of settle into it, you can hear the different umpires talking, and occasionally we'll hear the, um, the calls going out calling the different teams of the ball boys and ball girls up, or um, uh, calls going out to the uh, competitors for dressing rooms closing, or importantly, the prize money office closing. You know, they want to get in there before the day's done. Um, so those are all kind of things that kind of run in an ideal world, in a kind of autonomous way. But actually, had I been getting quite excited now, had I been getting super close into this microphone, and had there been a sound engineer not at the back of the room kind of reacting to that, you know, this is a space that's, that's off down the corridor. It's, it's got the, um, the press center team in. They're just calling people in for interviews. Nobody's really actively monitoring how that person is um, against that microphone. Um, so you, you could find yourself in a place, and, and this is what used to happen years ago before we had it, ears properly across everything. The microphone in the ball boys and ball girls area would be absolutely squaring out. You go down there and go, what on earth is this noise? Um, but actually by us just keeping that kind of stuff trickling in the background, we can go down there and go, ah, okay, right, have they all got a little bit out of hand? Okay, right, you, oh, you're on the evening shift, okay, you've come in to cover, you don't actually need to swallow the microphone. Yeah, the system will do that for you, all right? So, um, I say we control it all from there. Um, we have a series of um, uh, screens. We have, um, we kind of use uh, Adalynx um, Infinity KVM quite extensively. Um, we have lots of systems in place at Wimbledon, lots of different applications running on lots of different computers doing lots of different stuff. Those screens there don't actually show, there's no computer physically on the back of them. Um, they're just a KVM endpoint, which allows us to, um, uh, in a kind of like back in the days of 24, when you're like, send that to my screen, and actually like we could move that up and down the bench in the control room, or actually I could keep my eye over what the comms team are doing um, just, you know, going, actually, no, actually, it's the third one that you want to do or, or, you know, that kind of conversation. Or equally, we can put any of that content on, on the tellies or something like that. But it also means that, actually, if, if it all falls apart and the wheels absolutely come off, I can go to the rack room, and in that rack room is the computer that is responsible for the systems that are in that room. So that's where the physical computer is. So if you, you know, if you, that's what you needed to do, that's, you could go there. But in that control room, you can see and access all of those different services. So it's all about kind of making that stuff accessible um, and, and, and visual so people can see it. Um, we're also able to take um, a lot of that, that video content and push it up onto that, that video wall. All of those tellies are actually fed off Riedel's um, MediaNet Microns, so um, kind of proper uh, video router. We take the video feeds from um, Wimbledon Broadcast Service, so we brought the kind of host broadcast in-house a couple of years ago, um, and we go and collect um, 36 lines of video from them. That's also where we take the core mixes. So there is a sound team in one of the booths or in one of the trucks that are generating the mix for court four. Um, and that's where we take that full mix from in order to present back onto those commentary box units. You might be up there doing your radio package for your player that's on court seven. You want the, the atmos from what was going on on court seven as well as being able to mix in the umpire or something like that. Um, and something that I spent, um, fell down a little bit of a rabbit hole doing. Um, so well, this is just two nine up video, you know, multi-views. What are you talking about, Rue? Um, the audio meter on the left is the umpire's microphone post switch. The audio meters on the right are the AFL off the respective A and B mixes that are going out to the amplifiers. Um, so when um, you, you know an umpire um, clicks on and starts talking, you can see from a heads up thing which courts are in play, um, but also perhaps when a message goes out to the southern courts, 
um, from the safety team, you can see that actually all the meters are bouncing on all of the southern courts. So it's a really good kind of visual display um, of trying to make in all that work. Um, one of the things that I didn't manage to get to the bottom of um, during lockdown was making the, um, the UMD, the under monitor display, toggle um, different colors as and when the mute switch um, on the desk is open or closed. That's still on my to-do list, but I'll get there one day. Um, so obviously we're, we're in this um, room um, kind of mixing everything, but we, how do we judge how loud or quiet that is out in the field? Um, we actually rely quite heavily on um, uh, our intercom system. Did I say I was an intercom guy at heart? Sorry, I mean, this is kind of coming out now, the truth is out. Um, so in order to enable all of this to work, we have um, a kind of so a core team in the control room and then a team out on the ground, um, pr these days using Riedel's Bolero wireless belt pack system. Um, so it allows the guys um, to be stood by the side of court, um, judge, you know, is there a lot, you know, is it a, an important match? Is there a massive crowd around it? Should we put another couple of clicks on the, the umpire or, should, or actually it's, that crowd has gone away now, let's turn that down a touch and, and it's all these kind of micro adjustments that's so just trying to keep it all steady throughout the day. Um, and that means that the guys can do the rounds on the floor, talk back, um, full duplex uninterrupted to, to the operators in the chair and they can easily just say hang on a minute and I'll, I'll talk back. Um, so we use that quite extensively. We also do that, the picture on the right there is our um, courtside statisticians. So those are the people that are logging where the balls are hit from, you know, was it forehand, backhand and all of that kind of stuff which basically goes to build all of that stat graphic when you see the percentages you know, you know, morph onto the screen of how many shots were hit back and forth. Those are the people that kind of make that all happen. Um, now, I've mentioned um, uh, Dante a little bit um, through this. Um, we actually have uh, three kind of discrete Dante environments or workspaces, um, two of which which are now um, under the kind of um, control of a, a Dante domain manager and one of which which is still outside of that. So the first one is, is what we would call our closed um, network. So our rack rooms, um, we have our own core and edge um, network switches in them that are maintained by the technology department, by the same guys that are maintaining, you know, my printer's not working or I can't get the Wi-Fi to work in the corridor. Um, but those, those switches that we have in the rack, our audio rack rooms are um, solely for, for audio services. So one of the VLANs or two of the VLANs that reside on those switches are what we would call our closed Dante environment. Okay? That's where our amplifiers are sitting. That's where the lot of our um, audio processing is sitting and all that kind of stuff. Then we have two um, VLANs on the corporate site-wide network. Um, now, we went to this kind of uh, two VLAN model before the days of, of, of DDM was a, was, a, was a thing and a viable option because we wanted to be able to safeguard the audio services next to the court. Okay? Back to this thing, I don't want to get called into the office to explain why the radio might stop working and actually the reason be somebody in the hospitality suite thought they could just plug their laptop in the hole where the Avio unit was. Okay? Um, so what we did is we, we physically separated out. So there's two discrete, well, four discrete VLANs. Um, the, um, our umpire's chairs, the sound webs in the bottom of the umpire's chairs, that's where we take that analog signal off the umpire's microphone and turn it into a Dante signal. It then goes over the corporate network and then back to our, our rack rooms. We also take an analog off that umpire's chair back to our rack, our rack room. So we dual path the um, umpire's chair and we dual path the, the radio mics. Um, there's a third split off both of those. Broadcast are more than welcome to come and collect it locally um, by the side of the court. Um, they do in some cases and in other cases they just take the MADI that I deliver into MCR. Um, so the, we physically separate those out and then on the kind of what we term as the site wide is where the, um, a lot of that kind of MX wireless kit is in the hospitality suites. Um, the, Avio unit that's taking the mini jack after what was the awful phone that some kind of like hospitality rep has turned up that they want to play their Spotify playlist on or whatever that is. Um, so recently we've gone to managing those under DDM which has been really useful because when you've got something like 300 odd devices just on the corporate network, how do you know which one's offline? You know, I mean, yes, I can sit there and I can count through every line of Dante controller, um, but actually, you know, that comes with its own 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 issues and dramas. Um, so just to kind of try and bring this all into a little bit to land as it were. Um, so brief rundown of the kind of like the normal day um, in the championships. Um, 
we would start at kind of like 7.15 in the morning, um, commencing our tests across the grounds. We go around and check um, almost all the loudspeakers because we have a bit of an A-B pattern to switch through the thing. Um, I catch up with BBC Breakfast um, first off because I don't want to appear on the weather. I don't want my voice to go out on the telly and I don't want any of my team um, to have that. And equally, I don't want to get a phone call from them to say you need to turn the music off or the test tone because you're disturbing that. Um, by eight o'clock, we're, um, start, we're testing the safety messaging system and then we have a bit of a break for breakfast and then the team are going around to set the courts ready for um, tennis. And then we are um, kind of underway and then this, this team, we kind of shrink the team down a little bit um, and then they close that out to the gates are now closed um, announcement. Um, in order to do all of this and kind of operate in that way, we rely heavily on um, system monitoring you know, remote monitoring of systems. So um, is the system online? Is it working? Is that loudspeaker circuit intact? Um, is the temperature in the rack room okay? Or, or, or are we cooking it, you know? Um, I have brought to the attention of our HVAC team a number of the fan call units that were just on a 12 hour on off cycle rather than a 24 hour cycle. But nobody had noticed that because that off cycle was in the middle of the night. Um, so um, you know, we would kind of rely heavily on all of that. So. Trying to, trying to uh, say, wrap this all up to the manufacturers in, in, in the room. Um, a lot of your software and your UIs are fantastic. Um, even with all the screen real estate that I've got here in our control room, when I've got a couple of dozen of these things, I don't actually have enough tellies to show all that information. Um, so please continue to build in the ability for me to kind of remote get that little green light that it's all good, that, it, that it's happy. Um, and then when it's not, absolutely, I can delve into it. Um, so for me, a site like this and the key to kind of being able to make that all work is having that kind of remote um, kind of control and ability. And as I say, it allows me to sit in the comfort of my chair and play Christmas songs everywhere. Um, I say there's loads more that I could talk about and I'll, um, I'll skip over that little nest egg and um, bring that into land. Have we got Rob questions or... Sorry, it was a bit of a rush, sorry. No, thank you. I could tell that that was a little bit more than you would like to say. Um, but that's perhaps a good thing. Maybe you'll come back and we'll and tell us some more some other time. Does anybody have a question for Brew on anything that we've seen about this quite... Um, yeah, please, go ahead. Okay. So I, I'll just repeat that. For, I don't know where you got that on the live stream. So the question was, um, when I talk about A-B systems, so if I go back to um, our Court 14 picture. Okay, so um, we have a... A and a B amplifier circuit. So um, we use four channel amplifiers, um, but I'm only using, let's call, say, channel one of my A amplifier and channel one of my B amplifier to drive the, the four circuits, um, sorry, the two circuits that are on court 14 there, okay? The A amplifier is off my A UPS, the B amplifier is off my B UPS, and that's independent cabling. Sadly, a lot of the cable does follow the same terrestrial route. We're not, we've not been able to get as far as having diverse terrestrial routes for the loudspeaker cabling. Um, but we do have that in something like um, a number one court. We have two rack rooms, each east and west side of the, the stadium roof. Um, and within those rack rooms, they are A and B. You know, we've got the A rack, the B rack, and that's, that's how that's um, kind of interwoven. So we've got kind of that, that two level redundancy. So actually, first part of a call, when more often than not, it's the UPS controller that's, that's, that's had enough for the day rather than the amplifier that's actually fallen over um, and we lose that rack, um, we're now just down to 50% um, ability as opposed to losing half of the building. Yeah, is that any question? Um, any more? Sorry, a bit of a nerdy question. Um, that's what we're here for, surely. <laughs> So um, we should probably talk more about this later. So there's, there's some uh, conjecture whether you should run the kind of like a red and blue networks, you know, two completely independent ones um, that don't converge. Um, we actually have two VLANs that exist on the same switch environment. Um, is how we operate that. Um, we are continuing to use the primary and secondary ports on our devices because it's just a 20p connector in it. I mean, that could go wrong. So why would I not plug the second one in? 
Um, but there are some nuances with that. But yeah, so the, um, they are, our corporate network, the, the two, the four VLANs on the corporate network um, are on the same um, switch environment. There's no um, physical separation. Um, the only physical separation is our closed world, and we actually use the Yamaha um, RSIO frames to bridge that. We have MY cards facing the corporate network, and then the, the, the RSIO frame, which faces our, our closed environment, to give us kind of physical bridge. Okay, this was all done before any of this would have been possible within DDM, so back in the day. Um, have we still got time for... You have time for one more, of course, yeah. Assuming you get your planning permission for the expansion... Ah, the golf course. Are you starting to plan the expansion? I have been planning the golf course for... When did I start? So I've been staff at Wimbledon for seven years now. No, eight years now. I started planning probably seven and a half years ago for what I thought should go on over there. Um, yes, there's lots of drawings, lots of plans, lots of evolution. Um, obviously, me deciding where the loudspeaker should go in the toilets of the space they first needed to build, settle on the plan for the thing before I can do that. Um, but yeah, one of the big challenges, which I'm sure you like, will all find hilarious, uh, we don't want to see anything. We want it all to be clean, no, all clean lines, okay? Um, does anybody make a connector that we can just leave in a pit of water and then we can dust it <laughs> off nine months later and it'll all be fine? I mean, it's shout, if you've got one, I'm all ears, yeah? Because um, me jumping up and down and going, no, I want pillars that sit above the ground um, is not making me very popular at the moment. But, yeah, that's one of the things. Um, Thank you, Bruce. I think one of the standout things for me from what you said was we've all uh, strived for many years to try and converge systems and bring them all together and make them all singing and dancing. And what was very clear to me from your presentation was from a pragmatic, practical, operational perspective, you've made the decision to kind of have some separation and demarcation. So thanks. That was really good to understand. Can we give for a round of applause, please? <laughs> So for those of us that are here in the analogue domain, it's time to pop off to the tent and have a lovely cup of tea and a rather posh bicky. And for those of you online, I hope you can put the kettle on quickly. Uh, we would like to welcome you back here at half past 11 for our second seminar of the day. So we'll see you all back then. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Brew.